I'm Steve Porter, Associate Director of the Center for Christian Thought at Biola University, uh, also Professor of uh, Philosophy and Theology here at Biola. And I have with me today uh, two esteemed uh, Christian philosophers. Uh, on my right is Professor Richard Swinburne, Emeritus uh, Noloff Professor of the Christian Religion at the University of Oxford. And uh, to his uh, right is Dr. Uh, Tim O'Connor, uh, Professor of Philosophy at Indiana University. Uh, our theme at the Center for Christian Thought uh, this year is neuroscience and the soul, and so we will largely be staying in that, uh, that realm of discussion, but, but who knows, we might, uh, we might stray elsewhere. Um, I thought I'd start out by asking you, Richard, um, your view, uh, which you call, as many others have, substance dualism, could you offer just a, a brief description of what substance dualism is, and then also, why should an average uh, Christian layperson uh, be concerned with whether or not substance dualism is the uh, correct account of human nature? I think that all humans on earth have uh, consist of two parts, a body and a soul. And the soul is the part that thinks and feels and decides. And uh, the body is the part that uh, uh, is in causal interaction with it and uh, uh, causes so uh, some of our feelings. And uh, we, w uh, we learn about the world through, through our eyes and ears and we act on the world through our, with our arms and legs. So the body is the vehicle through which we learn about the world um, and through which we act upon the world. But the real essential me is the soul. Uh, at death, uh, these two come apart. Um, the body decays eventually, and, but the soul is still there. And uh, it's there, in my view, uh, uh, ready to be joined to a new body in the general resurrection, which God will bring us all to life. Um, in the meantime, uh, the normal Christian view has been that the soul continues and uh, humans continue to exist, but only with souls. Uh, the souls will be reunited to a, possibly the, the remains of the old body, but at any rate, uh, many other new parts to so that it forms a new body in the general resurrection. That's all, almost always been the normal Christian view of the matter. Why does it matter? Well, uh, it matters uh, firstly because of the normal Christian view that we continue to exist after death uh, before any general resurrection. And uh, since our bodies are decayed and in the, in the ground, uh, it must be the soul, which uh, if we don't have a soul, we don't continue to exist. But more importantly, um, the soul is the vehicle of our identity. That is to say, uh, if, let's ask, what is it that makes a future person at the general resurrection me? Uh, well, he can't, that person can't have all my body, many bits of uh, uh, decay. At any rate, uh, even in life, uh, I have different, different bits all the time. New cells are re replace old cells. So um, what, what would make a future person me? And if you say, well, uh, it would be that the, the future, the person with the future body has certain memories and certain character, well, uh, there could be innumerable people with rather similar memories and rather similar character, but that wouldn't make them me. At any rate, uh, who knows how much of our memories of our past life we might have at the general resurrection. There's got to be something that makes a future person me. And uh, if the soul is the essential part and continues to exist, then the future person is me if, <laughs> if it has my soul, otherwise it isn't me. So the soul is the guarantee of a unique person after the resurrection being me. And uh, since life after death is important, uh, the soul is the guarantee of that life after death. So for these reasons, it is very important that we hold this view. Tim, could you offer a brief uh, description of your view, uh, emergent individualism, and uh, as well, wh why should the average uh, Christian uh, be concerned that your view uh, is the correct view of the matter? Right. Well, let me start by saying uh, that I hold my views on this, as well as many other philosophical matters, rather tentatively. Um, it could well be true. 
um, that uh, mind-body dualism is correct, that the soul is, the biblical language of the soul is properly understood to refer to an immaterial part of me um, that's uh, separable in principle from my body. Um, still, I, I tentatively incline towards uh, a different view on which uh, I am, uh, all of my parts are physical parts. I'm a biological organism but that uh, many of the capacities that we most associate uh, with ourselves as persons, our, our, our capacities of thought, action, desire, intention, and, and so forth, uh, these capacities emerge from the body. They're not reducible to bodily processes, um, but they are caused and sustained, partially caused and sustained by um, our, uh, the, the proper functioning of our brains and nervous systems are, are required for these capacities to persist and to function properly. And so I call this the emergent individual's view. Uh, why is it important to hold this view? Uh, well, um, I, I think there's more than one view that a, a Christian lay person could be drawn to uh, that would be adequate both for theological purposes and uh, for purposes of integration with other things we know. But I, I prefer this view because I'm, I'm much drawn to uh, uh, Francis Bacon, the uh, uh, famous uh, thinker uh, of, of the early modern era who spoke of uh, God's two books, the book of his works of creation or of nature and the book of his word. And uh, both books, uh, through both books, we learn about ourselves and uh, important complementary truths. And uh, it seems to me that in recent years, especially since about the mid 20th century, um, we've uh, come to learn uh, increasingly a lot about one aspect of the Book of God's works, namely how our, our bodies function and specifically our brains and how they develop. And it, it seems uh, to me that a view on which human persons are fully embedded in the natural world uh, is, is it's going to be in, important to maintain, both when we look at the, uh, the biological history of the, the slow uh, emergence and development of increasingly sophisticated kinds of living things, uh, including ourselves, uh, much later in the game, and then also what we know about organismic individual development from embryonic state all the way to a fully matured human being. There's a gradual development in, in an increasing sophistication of mental function uh, that correlates very closely with the um, uh, development and uh, uh, the, the, the development of our brain and nervous system. And so a view on which new capacities are emerging as brain structure is developing in maturity seems to me to, to fit well with the information that we have. And so I, I think it's important as a Christian, and, and I'm sure Richard agrees, that we integrate what we, we think about human persons um, based on revealed truths with what we come to learn to varying degrees of confidence uh, from the study of the natural world, because certainly we, we do get information about persons um, and our natures uh, from scientific study of human beings. Uh, I have uh, no quarrel with the idea that uh, uh, soul and body are closely connected. Uh, indeed, I emphasize that our, our, power, our mental powers are sustained by, by our bodies and that we act through them. Uh, but uh, uh, my views on the soul are not derived uh, from, although they are of course compatible with, they are not derived from Christian doctrine, but they seem to me compelling uh, arguments uh, from purely secular knowledge in favor of this view. If you were to try and tell the whole history of the world, you would have to tell what happened to physical things. Uh, that is to say, tables and chairs and planets, uh, which are physical in the sense that everybody has equal access to them. We can eat, see as well as anybody else. There's a table there, uh, there's a planet out there in the sky, uh, and uh, we can each see as well as anybody else what is going on in my brain, at least if we tra take trouble to learn a little neuroscience. Um, it's a public piece of knowledge. I. Um, if you, you can find out what's going on in my brain, I can find out what's going on in my brain, and conversely. But when we come to 
thoughts and feelings and beliefs and desires and intentions. Um, I, the, the subject, the person who has them, has privileged access to them. Uh, he or she knows better what they're thinking about, what they're intending. Um, you can, of course, make an inference from my behavior about what I'm trying to do. And maybe my, if you look at my brain, that'll tell you a bit more. But then I could make that inference from my behavior and look at my brain. Uh, but I have a greater access to it because I'm actually doing the trying, and I know that. And therefore, there are truths about the mental life which simply are not truths about, even though they may be caused by goings on in the brain. And given that, uh, all the same, even if you knew, even if by some mechanism or other, you knew uh, everything, not merely that was happening to my body and brain, but what thoughts were connected with that, there would be still an all-important truth that you wouldn't know. That is to say, who was having these thoughts? Because after all, uh, the world could in all public respects be the same, uh, uh, only uh, if I had your body and you had mine. And um, if I was having your thoughts connected with your body and you were having my thoughts connected with my body. So a full account of the world will not have merely have to describe bodies, physical things, and what physical properties they have, mass, size, shape, and so on. Also, it must describe the mental goings on, uh, the thoughts and feelings, but it would also need to add who was having these thoughts and feelings. The world could be different, as I say, in the respect that uh, you could have my body and I could have yours, but it could also be different in the respect that uh, a quite different person could own this body and I could never have existed, and yet not merely will all the public phenomena be the same, but the same thoughts and feelings would be going on. So a full story of the world has got to tell the history of persons, and merely supposing that's the history of bodies would have left something out. It would have left out who was having the body, who were having the thoughts and the feelings. And so there must be something extra and beyond, and that something is not merely the existence of a mental life, but the existence of someone who has a mental life. Um, uh, and um, uh, we can give it a name for the extra bit that's essential, call it a soul. But if you say there is no bits to me apart from my body, then it would follow that we would know all about the history of the world if we simply knew about the history of bodies and the feelings that were associated with them. But clearly we wouldn't, because you wouldn't know who was in control of the body. So inevitably, the very fact of, of human consciousness forces us to say we can only make sense of this in terms of a soul. And given that there's a soul, then it's a part of me, and it could continue to exist after death. Of course, I don't think you can give an argument of the philosophical kind to show that it does continue to our, uh, exist after death, but uh, I can give argument of a philosophical kind to show that it could, and uh, Revelation can make it clear to us that it does. But if the alternative doctrine were true, if the only things were physical things, then our bodies could be reduced um, not merely to bones in the grave, but could be turned into energy, so there would be nothing left to constitute us. And um, that, uh, seems to me, would rule out life after death. I'll just briefly um, uh, respond. Uh, uh, the difference between the view that I'm proposing and the, the more traditional view that, that Richard uh, very capably defends uh, is uh, in some respects a rather subtle one, and that's borne out by the fact that mu much of what he said, especially the, the opening part of his remarks, I, I fully agree with. That, that is, uh, I think our mental lives cannot be captured in purely physical terms. Uh, my conscious thoughts and feelings, intentions, goals, and so on uh, are, are aspects of me, properties I manifest, capacities that I have, that are not the simple resultant of uh, even complex neurophysiological uh, processes. Um, they are causally sustained by those processes, but they're distinct from those processes. Mm -hmm. so, so we agree on that. 
Uh, and then the question, the difference between our views is just where do those capacities reside? And I say they, they reside within the living organism. They are associated with the living organism. And so then that would, uh, R Richard says there's a further fact um, uh, th about who is, is owns the thoughts. That is, um, it's, he, he, he suggests that it's possible that I might have, things might have been so constructed um, that I might have controlled his body and he might have controlled mine. Um, but uh, that, I, that a supposition that that's so much as possible, I think, depends on presupposing the, the mind-body dualism that this alternative rejects. So if, if in fact, um, these capacities are capacities of this organism and his psychological capacities are capacities of that organism, then that would not be a possibility, that there is not that further fact um, to be accounted for. So Richard, uh, uh, Tim, Tim has suggested that his view, this emergent view, uh, comports with the uh, contemporary neuroscience. And some might think that substance dualism um, is in trouble when it comes to contemporary neuroscience because these things that we used to thought we used to think that the soul was uh, responsible for, we're finding out that the brain is responsible for. So, how do you respond uh, to this idea that the that the soul is you know we have kind of a soul of the gaps uh, response that we don't need the soul anymore given uh, what we understand about the the brain? Well, I've given a, a straight philosophical argument for the existence of the soul. Um, so. Uh, uh, your, your point is uh, that it doesn't fit with, with uh, contemporary neuroscience. Uh, well, I, I don't see that at all. Uh, I've no objection to any particular detailed result that contemporary neuroscience ha has uh, uh, made. Uh, quite clearly, we are influenced, our, our choices are influenced by goings on in the brain. Um, but this isn't news. Um, it, it's, we've, it's, we've always known that uh, humans are influenced in their choices by physical goings on. Uh, it, it's well known that if people haven't eaten for 24 hours, they feel hungry and they are inclined to eat. Um, this has been known for millennia. Um, all that neuroscience has done has, has been to add a lot of further bits of information of that sort. Uh, neuroscience has told us the mechanism by which we, um, lack of uh, food causes the desire to, to, to eat. And neuroscience has pointed out other mechanisms that are at work causing desires. But neuroscience has never shown how, uh, whether uh, which persons will inevitably act on the desires to which they, they are subject. Uh, we have a choice of whether to act on one desire or another, whether to do what we believe good or to yield to a temptation to do what, what is evil. And no result of neuroscience has shown that we can't do that. Um, uh, some results of neuros, or rather some statements of neuroscientists about what they have achieved seems to be a manifestly false account of what in fact they have achieved. Tim, Richard uh, made the claim that, if I'm getting it right, no, no amount of, of contemporary neuroscientific evidence is going to show that there isn't any such thing as the soul uh, understood in a dualist sense. Do you, do you agree with that? And, and then if so, how is it then that you made the claim earlier that you think this emergentist view comports better with with uh, biological evidence, including neuroscientific evidence. Good. Um, I think I probably agree with Richard that neuroscience is, at any rate, unlikely to demonstrate the non-existence of the soul understood as a as a um, purely mental substance. Um, it's, it, it's scientific theorizing is always a matter of putting an interpretation, trying to put the best interpretation on observable facts. Um, and um, uh, it's, it, it doesn't usually proceed by way of you know, outright demonstration of, of truths. It's just certain theories seem to prove more fruitful and more predictively powerful than other theories and are therefore, run, we run with them until, until better theories come along and new data that need to be accommodated. Um, so. In a nutshell, um, the, the, what, if you've been comparing our views, there, there's a strong agreement on that, that our mental lives do not reduce to our physical lives. So why, what difference does it make? Well, 
uh, for uh, my view, new capacities emerge. Th think about the development of a, of a living organism, our bodies. Um, we have a lot of, if we are fully intact functioning adult human beings, we have a lot of sophisticated cognitive um, capacities and affective capacities of emotion and desire and so forth. Um, as I b understand the dualist view, um, one would have to suppose if the soul emerges or appears uh, in the, the very early stages of embryonic development, uh, since the soul has no parts, uh, it's not a composed object, all of its basic capacities are sort of there from the get-go. Um, and then as the brain matures, some of those, uh, many of those capacities are completely latent. Young infants can't do calculus, all right? Um, but as the brain matures, uh, then these, the, 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 what the soul is capable of doing and engaging in, in thought now becomes activated. It has, has the, the, the necessary physical causal conditions on it. Um, that's a possible view, um, but it's, it's, it suggests a kind of an abrupt break. So you have a, a very immature organism that is associated with something that has these, these potentially quite complicated functions uh, uh, um, already fully intact, uh, rather than on my view, um, the, the mental capacities, since they are capacities of the organism, develop in tandem with the development of the organism. And that just seems to me a more natural interpretation um, of, of what we know about organismic development. So. Um, one point I, I would, uh, one stage in your argument uh, seemed to me mistaken. You were arguing from the fact that uh, the soul has no parts to the fact that um, it can't uh, uh, grow in its capacities. Uh, but I don't see that follows at all. Capacities are properties are of, of a thing, and a thing can acquire many extra capacities, even if the, these all belong to one part. So, so I don't follow that stage of the argument. But more substantially, it seems to me that any theory which says there is a sharp break <laughs> has a lot more to be said for it than any theory that says there is a gradual evolution. Because um, you, you took the, the, the fetus developing into to the child, but if we take, for example, the gradual development of the human race uh, from uh, inanimate matter over time, four billion years ago, nothing had any feelings or thoughts. Now we have lots of feelings and thoughts. So sometime or other, there must have been a first feeling or thought, some mental event that the subject was aware of and to which he had privileged access to which uh, uh, of a kind that had never happened before. That seems to me inevitable. If some, there was once upon a time there weren't any such things and now there are such things, there must be a first time at which such things appear. Now, of course, we don't know what that time is. Uh, my argument uh, is compatible with uh, uh, the higher animals having thoughts and feelings, and, and therefore, by my argument, having souls. Um, but uh, who knows? Uh, nobody knows whether, whether ants have feelings or whether fish have feelings. Um, I'm inclined to think that only mammals have feelings. But there comes a time, a sharp time, and uh, uh, um, if a theory says there isn't a sharp time, it seems to me it hasn't grasped the very nature of the mental, which is so different from the physical. It's something to which the subject has privileged access. And the moment there is a being who has mental events, has thoughts and feelings to which he has privileged access, there is someone who has these thoughts and feelings. And uh, it's a fact about the world that that individual had them rather than any other individual. And that, given that, uh, and given that the body uh, uh, doesn't carry the identity because uh, I could have a different body, uh, it must be another part of me that has an I that identity. So the very emergence of consciousness must bring with it a soul. And that's how it is. There is this sharp break in evolution because something has appeared that simply wasn't there before. And if uh, some evolutionary theory tries to show there isn't a break, then it must be mistaken for this reason. The, the facts are just 
stare one in the face on, on this matter. The uh, French neuroscientist Benjamin Libet did certain experiments in the 1980s, which other neuroscientists um, generalized to show, uh, which, which they suggested showed that never do our intentions, our purposes, make any difference to what we do. What we do is controlled just by brain goings on, and we think we have formed an intention, and that's why uh, we do something, but really it's, it's just brain goings on that make this difference. And the evidence which was brought forth for that by, at any rate, the followers of Libet, was that they found that whenever somebody does uh, an intentional action, uh, decides to move their hand or decides to go for lunch or something, there is always some build-up of electrical potential on their skull which um, uh, uh, indicates some brain going on. And uh, many neuroscientists, and uh, that happens before uh, the subject forms any intention to go to lunch or any intention to wave their hand. And so many neuroscientists said, oh, well, what that shows is that the brain event causes the motion of the hand and the intention has nothing to do with it. But of course, all that the experiment showed is that uh, equally compatible with the experimental results w would have been that the original brain event causes the intention and the intention itself causes the motion of the hand. Uh, well, um, uh, neuroscientists could try and do some more complicated experiment uh, which might show that uh, the motion of our hands was simply caused by bodily goings on. But I don't think they could ever show that the intentions, our intentions don't cause that. Though in some few cases they might uh, show that we are uh, for, uh, compelled by bodily uh, going, brain goings on to form an intention. But uh, I see no reason to suppose that to be generally the case because all that neuroscience throws up is information about the inclinations, the desires to which we are subject. And we all know that when faced with a choice with acting on some desire or yielding to temptation, it's up to us what we do. And um, uh, nothing that neuroscience has shown has any inclination to show that it isn't in those cases. So on this view, um, dualism actually uh, helps preserve uh, free will uh, in a way that uh, otherwise uh, free will might be uh, brought into question. Yes. Um, I don't think dualism is necessary for holding a doctrine of free will, but it certainly uh, <laughs> helps to accentuate, to bring out what is involved in it. That is to say that what determines our, our actions is uh, what we, we determine our action, and we determine our action in the light of reasons and desires to which we are subject. And uh, intuitively we know, or think we know, that's how, how, how things happen. And nothing that uh, any neuroscientist has produced uh, uh, shows that it isn't. And Tim, I know you've been concerned to uh, defend uh, a version of free will as well. Do you think that your emergent view uh, uh, helps with the free will question vis-a-vis uh, -vis substance dualism? Uh, I, I believe it's as compatible as substance dualism is with the view that we, we exercise a, a limited measure of autonomy. We are not perfectly free beings. We, we're constrained. Um, as uh, science shows, not just neuroscience, but shows through psychology, we're often subject to unconscious influences. So it's a constrained freedom of will, but I think we do have sufficient freedom that we can be held morally accountable for our choices. Um, we, we, it's a commonplace that the popular press often does a very poor job of reporting scientific findings, and uh, I agree with Richard that in some cases the scientists themselves are a source of the problem in so far as they put philosophical glosses on their findings that go well beyond their, f their, their findings. They're putting an interpretation on their findings um, that uh, the, the, the results themselves uh, hardly um, uh, imply. 
um, although they, they might be compatible with the findings. And so um, I, I agree with Richard that it's often overblown so, um, some, of the, some of the interesting things that are being learned um, about uh, how the brain functions. Um, but uh, it's, we should recognize that uh, the science of the brain is still in relative infancy or maybe in its adolescence, you might say, at this point. Um, uh, before the 1950s, very little was known about the details of brain function. Um, and now scientists seem to have a very good handle on how individual cells of the brain, neurons interacts, interact, um, transmitting chemicals across synapses and, and that sort of thing. But how large-scale um, assemblies of neurons produce uh, are involved in the production of complicated bodily behavior, and as, let alone conscious choices, is still uh, not well understood at all. There is a differentiation of function. Um, scientists have been able to identify different regions of the brain being associated with different functions like the visual cortex and the auditory cortex and so forth. But uh, most of the, of the really crucial details about how um, uh, complex behaviors produced are, 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 are still wide open. Um, and uh, I agree that the, the, the Libet findings just sh show that there's activity, um, uh, a, a kind of um, preparatory activity perhaps, uh, where we know we're about to, and, you know, you have to think about the Libet sort of scenario where, where you're, you're being invited to, um, to, to engage in a specific behavior, such as w wiggling your finger, within a short interval of time, and then you're just asked to spontaneously um, uh, decide when you will engage in that behavior. And that there should be some sort of anticipatory um, brain activity to enable a smooth uh, carrying out of that behavior w when a choice is made is, is not terribly surprising, right? We don't, uh, on no sensible view, whether su a substance dualist view or, or my sort of view or even on a materialist view, on no view do uh, choices just come out of the blue, uh, quite apart from any antecedent influences. Um, so uh, I, yeah, I think, I, think I, I do want to have a view on which we have, a cap we have capacities to make choices that don't reduce to physical capacities and that we, we consciously control that capacity. Um, uh, at least in many circumstances, uh, when we're fully in control of our faculties and we're, we're aware of uh, real options available to us. And I think that's wholly consistent with the findings of neuroscience. Yes, all that the neuroscientists have discovered in more detail about the goings on in the brain before we made uh, decisions uh, only allow, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they may have established a correlation between certain goings on and say the subject moving their hand, but the correlation is not 100%, it's 80% or 75%, that is to say, and that indicates that what they've discovered is an inclination to do it, to which eventually the subject may or may not decide to follow. But one point about neuroscience I wouldn't altogether agree with you about individual neurons. Sure, uh, what is known is that um, <laughs> the brain is a large collection of neurons and each neuron transmits uh, an electrochemical influence to the next neuron. But how, how it, it does this by releasing a small amount of transmitter substance which uh, clings to the next neuron and starts, starts uh, an, an electrical pulse passing through that. But whether it does this or not just depends on just how much transmitter substance is released and just how wide the gap between the two neurons, the synaptic cleft, is and just what happens to each bit of transmitter substance that's released. And the, these are goings on on a very, very small scale. And such literature as I have read imply, uh, is certainly favorable to the view that these goings on, uh, whether enough uh, neuro, whether enough transmitter substance is released at the cleft in order to start an impulse uh, passing through the next neuron, uh, depends on such small differences that these differences lie within the quantum limit. That is to say, um, the great uh, physical theory of the 20th century, quantum theory, 
uh, is an indeterministic theory. Uh, it says that on the small, smallest of small scales, uh, you can only talk about probabilities of things happening, not about uh, inevitabilities of things happening. And the scales involved in the transmission of um, electric charge from one neuron to another are on that very small scale, so that whether the uh, potential is transmitted does depend on something within the quantum limit and is therefore not uh, predetermined. Of course, it is logically possible that these <laughs> that uh, 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 these very small differences uh, in one neuron isn't going to make a very great difference to our large-scale behavior. On the other hand, it may make a very large-scale difference to our behavior. That isn't known, but there is a, undoubtedly a certain amount of indeterminism in the brain, so it would be perfectly compatible with all we know uh, about um, uh, the operation of the brain to suppose that some of its operation is not determined by physical laws. And Richard, just since we're on this kind of issue of, of origins, uh, on your view, and, and perhaps if you could uh, think of it too, not just in a theistic evolutionary picture, but but those Christians that hold to some sort of direct creation of of the first human uh, persons. Um, on your view, does the soul? How does the soul come into existence? You have this sharp break. What what the sharp break is the um, the emergence of the soul? What how does the soul come into existence on this? Well, uh, there's two possible theories. Either that, as it were. <laughs> it's a basic law of nature, the brain, when it reaches a certain form, a certain amount of, com certain kind of complexity, throws up a soul. Uh, or alternatively, that God gives to individuals who have a brain of that complexity, when it reaches that stage, a soul. Um, I don't have a very strong uh, view which of these is correct because, uh, I mean, God may operate through <laughs> producing laws of nature which are such that when the brain acquires a certain complexity then it throws up a soul or conversely he may act directly. And uh, as regards anything I've been saying uh, today, um, it's perfectly compatible with creationism. It, uh, as far as anything, I, even if even if uh, humans uh, are not produced, uh, uh, don't have an animal a ancestry, um, uh, still there must have been a first human, and uh, therefore again a break in the evolutionary uh, process. So it doesn't matter for the sake of my argument whether the process of evolution of bodies was gradual or uh, suddenly human bodies arrived. Uh, the production of the soul uh, must have happened at a particular time when a particular degree of complexity was there, and um, uh, that is the all-important difference, not the animal ancestry of bodies. Um, yeah. Tim, how would you how would you respond to that? And, and particularly, again, thinking of you might think that that this emergent individual's view uh, fits better with a, a theistic evolutionary picture of gradual uh, development. Uh, but if if you were addressing a, a Christians who believe in, for various biblical, theological, philosophical reasons, perhaps even in the direct creation of of uh, human persons, uh, that would seem to to be a view that that would. Uh, not fit as well with with the emergent uh, individuals view or do you have thoughts on that? Um, well, yeah, I think you've answered your own question. I, that, that is, I, I, I do think while the, the view that I'm suggesting uh, is consistent with some sort of notion of special divine intervention in the creation of human persons, it's it, it really is tailor-made for trying to integrate with the idea that human beings are embedded in the, this larger set of natural biological processes have appeared over as as more complex forms of organisms have appeared via purely natural processes, human beings coming at the tail end of that. Um, and uh, th that uh, the idea is that new, even as I develop organismically, I, I'm acquiring new fundamental capacities as the organism matures. Whereas, uh, and so it's, it's an attempt to be sensitive to the idea of gradual development. I agree with uh, a remark Richard made earlier that um, on any view on which the mentality does not reduce to the physical, there is some 
discontinuity. But there's discontinuity and there's discontinuity and, and just how, how sharp a discon it's an attempt to kind of minimize the discontinuity, uh, the, the degree of discontinuity. But if you have a picture on which God um, creates human individuals at a moment in time directly as it were, then why not go with the soul view? Um, it, uh, it, it has an easier time um, dealing with issues of uh, survival of death in the afterlife. On your view, uh, what, what comes at the moment of death? How would you explain the traditional uh, belief in continued existence? Well, I should say, first of all, I, I have no idea how, how it is that God preserves us. And so, um, but I think it's incumbent upon a, a thinker that wants to have a, um, a reasonable, coherent view that it at least be possible that we survive death. So it's, a impo so it's important as a philosopher, if you think we are, ascent as I do uh, tentatively, that we are essentially embodied beings. Um, survival of death does seem hard to understand. It, it can even look impossible on reflection. And so it's important that we be able to at least imagine some kind of scenario on which it could happen consistent with facts, the facts of death as we know them. Uh, so here's one way it might go. Um, it's, it's, it's a very speculative, uh, science fiction-y sounding um, uh, suggestion, um, but it's, again, it's just intended to be a, a possibility proof, uh, right? A, 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 an indication of one way it could go. Uh, presumably, um, God is more imaginative than I am, and maybe there are other ways um, that, that are better ways um, that it actually goes. But so here goes. Uh, suppose that right at the moment of your death, as you're about to die, let's say you've unfortunately situated yourself vis-a-vis -a, -vis a fast moving bus and you are right in front of it and you are a fraction of a second from being hit by that massive <laughs> fast moving bus and so are going about to die very quickly. Um, uh, suppose that the, the, the matter that composes you right at that moment each of the fundamental particles fission, split in two, you know, as amoebas uh, fission, right? Suppose that, that God has endowed the fundamental stuff that constitutes you um, with that, the capacity to fission. Maybe God miraculously brings to bear some sort of something that, uh, that is a necessary condition. God triggers some kind of latent disposition, right? Uh, and so then what happens is there are now two body products of this fissioning. Uh, one right where you were at the beginning of the process, which dies instantly, right? Uh, and another, we might suppose, and here's where it sounds very science fiction-y, uh, it, it, in a discontinuous manner, it uh, shows up in another location, safely out of harm's way. Or if you're, the, the manner in which you're dying is of uh, the decay of a disease, right? God uh, uh, prevents that death from occurring and brings about restoration of health. Okay, uh, and I say that would be you, uh, and what, what, what uh, remains on the ground in lifeless form is, is a mere offshoot of you. And the reason I say that's not you is because uh, there's no longer a continuity of, of uh, the mental function um, that is constitutive of you as a, as a living person, that the, these mental functions that give you an identity as a composite whole, that make you a particular being, that's preserved in this other bodies. So, so I think it's possible. That, so I think this very sketchy, uh, bizarre sort of picture shows that, perhaps shows that we could survive death, um, uh, but it's an embodied survival of death. And this is contrary to the way Christians have traditionally thought about the immediate survival of death. They've thought that we've survived in a disembodied state until the time of the general resurrection. Whereas on my view, if, if I'm essentially an embodied thing, um, that would be impossible. I have to be embodied in some form or other. Um, and uh, then you might think that makes the resurrection a rather anticlimactic affair rather than the, the, the object of Christian hope as it has been represented in the Christian tradition. Um, but uh, the, the reason the general resurrection is held out to us as a something to, to long for and to hope for is that we're, it's not just a time where we are restored to a bodily state, but we are, we are clothed with immortality, as the Apostle Paul says, that we, we now, we, our bodies sewn into the ground, uh, perishable bodies are raised imperishable. 
And so there's some kind of tr dramatic transformation that takes place. And I think that's consistent with my view that God could dramatically, right, we are changing things even on, on Earth as biological organisms. And who knows what the possibilities are for God to bring about still far more dramatic changes in the constitution of our nature, consistent with our continuing honest, conscious thinking things, such that as at the end result of a, perhaps a very rapid process that subjectively feels like it's instantaneous, but it's actually a highly compressed, rapid, dramatic transformation, uh, we, we now have um, uh, bodies that are, are not subject to decay and, and so forth. And it, it may also be a, a function of a, a very different sort of environment that we inhabit too, that accounts for some of the, the difference. Mm -hmm. May I Would make you? a comment on that? That seems to me a wildly uh, speculative ad hoc hypothesis. Uh, the suggestion that at uh, death uh, we split into two and uh, a total duplicate of our bodies is produced, but uh, we don't see it because it's taken away into a fifth dimension or something like that. It's not the slightest evidence that this is true. This is, this is own, only being brought in in order to make sense of how it could be uh, that we survive death, whereas the more traditional account which I have given is motivated originally simply by the need to describe mundane phenomena. Uh, they, uh, you couldn't describe the history of the ordinary world without bringing in the soul because you couldn't describe the ordinary history of the world without uh, telling who had what experiences and that's not a matter of, their, of who had what body. Um, and uh, uh, given that, then, uh, as it were, at death, clearly there are two parts. And clearly the part that decays is the bodily part. Uh, uh, so there is another part there. Uh, it doesn't need speculative uh, science to, to give you that. A mere analysis of what being conscious involves gives you that. Of course, uh, it's a further claim that this continues to exist, but it's perfectly compatible with death that it should continue to exist. It doesn't involve any new speculative science of, of any sort. And uh, so I think the traditional view is much to be preferred on that basis. Mm -hmm. uh, if I could just uh, briefly respond to that. I, I agree with, there, there are interesting uh, philosophical arguments for substance dualism. Uh, and Richard's, uh, he, he's defended su such arguments in several places. Um, and if he's right, then of course, um, uh, then, th th then those arguments alone give us reason to prefer that view. It's because I'm not persuaded by those arguments um, and that I do see at least a tension with uh, developmental biology with the substance dualist view that I'm, I'm inclined towards uh, this more monistic view of, of human nature. And then uh, it, it's true, the, the survival of death scenarios look um, a lot more, it looks like a lot more contrivance is required uh, in order for that to occur. And, and I agree, but I, I guess the, the one thing I would emphasize is that even if substance dualism is true and I survive death because God preserves my soul, I think that's something miraculous in any case. Um, that is, I don't think it's the Christian view, that, um, uh, the view that Plato held, that the soul is naturally immortal, right? That it just is liberated at death and it just, it's by its very nature because it's a simple object, it must persist. Um, I, I think that a reasonable substance dualism will say that um, the soul naturally depends on the body. Um, and so it, when the body decays and is no longer capable of playing that sustaining function, it requires divine intervention to keep it into being. So both views re, re, um, require that God act in a special way outside of ordinary natural processes in order to give us um, everlasting life. Both of you are uh, bright, capable uh, Christian philosophers. You've studied these views uh, carefully and, uh, and yet there's uh, substantive disagreement between you and we could bring in uh, three or four other uh, Christian philosophers and uh, folks who aren't Christians who have different views on this issue. What about the person who says, yeah, this is the problem with uh, philosophical uh, methodology. It's, it's not going to uh, bring any sort of answer to these questions that, uh, that's going to bring about you know, widespread agreement. Um, how, how do you respond to that kind of skepticism that, that this way of uh, going about answering these questions is, is um, 
is helpful. Richard, you can, we can start with you. Um, it's important to remember that uh, philosophy uh, is interested in questions of the deepest kind about what there is, what are the total constituents of the world, not just the physical constituents of the world, and what the world depends on. Uh, these are very deep questions, and it wouldn't be surprising if it takes many centuries, many millennia, to get, uh, get answers to them. Uh, it's taken two or three thousand years to get answers to some questions in physics or chemistry, and these are much deeper questions. So uh, it's not surprising in itself, um, uh, forgetting particular religious considerations, uh, that these things take time. But um, uh, we are both uh, reasonably convinced uh, that the Christian revelation is true, and um, we are pointing out uh, alternative ways of, of how it could be true. And um, uh, that's useful for people because uh, they may not find one of these ways very, uh, 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 very compelling or indeed even at all attractive. Uh, then the other way is available for them to think about the matter. So, um, it is good that there should be a certain variety of ways of spelling out the Christian tradition, um, so long as its essential message is, is there. And I think both of our ways are compatible with the essential Christian doctrines on the, these matters. Um, uh, doctrines that in life humans have free will, uh, the doctrine that uh, they survive death, uh, the doctrine of a resurrect, general resurrection after death. If this can be spelled out in more than one way, that is more reason for believing it rather than less. Yeah, um, there is uh, plenty of profound disagreement in um, uh, philosophy among people who studied uh, deep basic issues in philosophy. Um, as Richard says, uh, this is in part a reflection of that we're asking very, very fundamental questions that don't admit of direct empirical verification, although empirical information uh, can bear on some of these questions, as we've been suggesting. Um, and and uh, it, we're perhaps not especially well suited as human beings for um, handling these problems are not as well suited perhaps as we are for doing elementary arithmetic say or something where we have much more reliable procedures but uh, I also think that um, it sh sometimes it's overplayed uh, the philosophical disagreement I think there is such a thing as progress in, in philosophy there are uh, certainly there's a lot of uh, progress by way of rejection of ideas um, where the where the consensus of informed thinkers is a particular theorist's way of uh, handling a certain issue just won't work for pretty decisive um, uh, reasons. And so, so a winnowing, that over time there's a winnowing of the possibilities and um, greater cultivation of ideas. Ma uh, many contemporary ideas on basic issues and philosophies are just variations on ideas that Plato and and uh, Aristotle held, but they're more sophisticated. They're, 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 they're developed in response to objections to older versions of these views. And uh, so there is some progress. It's just, it, it is a slower progress. Well, I want to thank you uh, both for your time uh, today and your presence at the Center for Christian Thought.